Good morning. Our next speaker, Carol Franklin, is a founding principal of Andrew Pogon Associates and a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects. She's nationally recognized expert in the design of integrated living systems. The firm that she co-founded is Andrew Pogon Associates, has been at the cutting edge of issues of landscape sustainability from biodiversity, alternative stormwater management, to global climate change. She's worked nationally and internationally for more than four decades to create designs that draw out the inherent character of each site and capitalize on its unique resources. Her work creates a synergy between a number of disciplines, science, art, engineering and architecture, anthropology and economics, bringing a vision and a practical implementation of large-scale ecological concepts to each project. Her strength is in quickly understanding the key processes that govern a site and then translating that understanding into a framework that gives each site strong, authentic identity. Carol has served as an adjunct professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Regional Planning at the University of Pennsylvania from 1972 to 2002. And from 2002 to 2005, Carol taught cultural landscapes in the Department of Historic Preservation. She's given lectures and keynote addresses throughout the world and has, meant, and has won many awards, most recently the Russell Wright Manitoga Award for Environmental Design in 2009. With co-author David Contasta, she has recently pu published a four-volume community manual on the evolution under multiple owners and caretakers of a remarkable local watershed. Called Metropolitan Paradise, the struggle for nature in, ci in city, Philadelphia's Wic Wissahickon Valley, 1620 to 2020. It offers the Wissahickon Valley as a model for sustaining li living ecosystems in dense urban areas and for solving crises faced by our exploding cities and the collapsing natural world. Carol is an inspiration and leader in the design community in Philadelphia, nationally and internationally. Carol's career fits well into the collaborative nature of this meeting. Those of you who know Carol know that she speaks from the heart, and we look forward to hearing what she has to say today. I'm honored to present Carol Franklin. Thank you, Adam, for that very warm and flattering introduction. I am delighted and honored to be here today and certainly support your goals of um, collaboration. It's been something, whoops, sorry, uh, that landscape architects, I think, have been struggling to bring since uh, sort of the ecological revolution led by Ian McCarg at the University of Pennsylvania. I want to say that I'm calling this lecture The Rivers and the Grid. And for that title, I owe uh, Lily Milroy. It came out in one of our discussions about her new book, which is called The River and the Grid. And that's um, the Schuylkill. And um, basically, some of the things that are in the book are touched on here. Um, but what this uh, title is about is really what are the innovative ways that we can begin to really use each other's strengths. I hesitate to say that we are the rivers and you architects of the grid, but uh, <laughs> there has certainly been some of that in the past. And one of the wonderful things is the way that this is all coming together. And instead of being sort of the sub-consultant who's called in at the very last moment, we're really taking a place at the table and I think um, what this talk is going to be about is the kinds of things that landscape architects think about and can bring to the table in both city planning and architecture. Um, Penn City, one of the great legacies, and of course something that's haunted not only us, but most American cities, is Penn's grid plan for this two mile 
square between the Schuylkill and the Delaware. And all of you know that um, there are five squares. They moved around a great deal for almost 100 years and settled now where they are. But there you have it, square open spaces, a square grid between two great natural boundaries. And the other force, which was going along really even concomitant with Penn and his sons, because they had villas on the Schuylkill, was the sort of love of people who thought of themselves as old Philadelphia families, and who in some cases were old Philadelphia families, for that incredible pastoral landscape which sits above the bluffs of the Wissahickon. And here you see, of course, uh, Thomas Eakin's uh, picture of Scullers, of which there are many, many, but that shows you that that romance with this part, this river, has continued really up until the present time with all the fascinating and wonderful new plans that are being uh, developed for it in pieces and beginning to snatch the parts of the river that are unreclaimed um, at the moment uh, for a continuous open space system. Uh, one of the other fascinating things um, is that the Delaware was an industrial river. That's, this is called Design on the Delaware, and this is my apology for not talking about the Delaware. Not only do I know very little about it, but also uh, it was an industrial port, and Penn had very good reasons, and so did the traders, to say, let us develop the city from the Delaware on. So the Delaware, which had very high steep banks and was a difficult port, to operate. Then um, they mowed that down, they mowed down the bank, they created the port, they began to level the city, making some blocks, you know, some blocks were high. It was a grid system, so some blocks are gonna be high and some blocks are gonna be low. And if you've ever seen Adam um, Levine's wonderful uh, talk on water that he made for the water department, you'll know that there was an incredible amount of grading on what we think about as a flat city. The other thing was the rivers were used, the little tributaries to the Delaware were used basically uh, as a place to dump sewage, a good old fashioned tradition coming directly from England and the rest of Europe. And ultimately when this stank enough, the idea was to fill it in and create an actual uh, mechanical or structural tunnel and go from there. So we lost most of the natural landscape along the Delaware. And that, I think, is why the focus of our romance, our park system, has always been um, on the Schuylkill. And of course, the Schuylkill is much more able because it doesn't, has an expressway along it, unfortunately, but uh, not in all places. And it doesn't really preempt it the way I-95 does at the Delaware, which makes so many difficulties and really requires a huge imagination to make that leap between the city fabric uh, and the river itself. Uh, the other influence I want to just talk about, that all of these influences have sort of come together and they're part of our heritage, our legacy, our gestalt of what it is to be Philadelphian and what it is to design in Philadelphia. And the other influence, as I said, is the Quakers. They look awfully dour in this picture, don't they? But in fact, it was because of the Quakers, because they were radical Protestants, and because um, they were forbidden by the Clarendon Codes in 1660s in England from going to Oxford or Cambridge, known as Oxbridge. Um, they couldn't become civil servants, they couldn't become lawyers, they couldn't become priests. Basically, they had to go into the natural sciences and go to places like Manchester University <laughs> and learn all about geology. So uh, we, and, and practical things, because of course they became the great potters in the north um, and industrialists. So they brought to this country, was a, there's a wonderful book written about it called The Meeting House and the Counting House, that wonderfully practical mixture of money and spiritual morality, and a sense also of the beneficence of the natural world, which is very unique. Most radical Protestants don't have it. The Catholics tend to disavow it too. So we were very lucky we got the Quakers 
and with them a huge love of the natural landscape. And over 100 gardens, most of which were created by those early settlers and later on, and their ancestors later on. Um, one of the things that Philadelphia has that makes it absolutely special. You all know about Boston and the emerald necklace that um, Olmsted created. And essentially, Chicago has the same thing. There's a dense, built-up city, and around it, for escape, there are these wonderful green parks that have preserved special areas, and you go out from the city, and there you participate in nature. The thing that we have, and it's really what I'm going to talk about today, is this extraordinary riverine system, some of which is very successful, some of which is absolutely mangy. Um, we have the core of it, which is East and West Parks, which was called Fairmount Park and was the original core of Fairmount Park system. And then we have the Pennypack and the Wissahickon, which are the two most intact um, riverine park systems. And then we have things like uh, Pocessing, Tacone, Darby, and Cobbs. This is in order of what I think uh, works. And as you'll see at the very bottom, it says Cobbs Creek, little integrity, very fragmented, very large in holdings. And um, so some of these systems realized the vision, and a lot of them sort of fell by the wayside, got truncated, as you see up there, and really didn't capture the possibilities of this. But one of the possibilities, and I'm going to talk about it as a gradient of wildness, it's also this business of nature finger. most of our cities, even uh, after the automobile, when we created those sort of automobile roads, we'll call them. Um, this is Adam Levine's wonderful maps. He's so brilliant and articulated. Um, doesn't matter, it still shows very accurately that that is what Philadelphia was. A truly tributaries draining to the Delaware, a major tributary, which is the Schuylkill, and then the Wissahickon, which is a tributary to the Schuylkill. Um, here, you see what I was talking about when I said the original city, uh, the commerce on, at the port was one of its driving factors. And you see these straight orange lines. Those are the sewers. Those are the buried rivers. And I put three spots. Uh, by the areas that are where those rivers still largely exist and have been kept for us as part of these riverine park systems and have phenomenal potential, although it's not always realized, to interfinger into the built environment and to cross the grid, to open it up, to do amazingly sort of quirky things, which greatly relieves what you see sometimes in North Philadelphia is that sort of ghastly, absolutely unrelenting monotony of the grid with nothing relieving it. Um, this is what we did. This is just very quick, from again, from Adam's lecture. There's an old farmhouse in West Philadelphia. Here's putting Mill Creek, and we all know what that did into that sewer, and then all the houses fell on top of it and continued to do so. Um, but there's the farmhouse still. Of course, it's not in existence today. Um, and here was the core of the original Fairmount Park, which was East and West Parks. East Park, of course, East River Drive, West Park, West River Drive. I know they've all got married names now, but I always call them by their maiden names. <laughs> and what you see and what you're going to see again throughout this talk is this long line of green that leads to the heart of City Hall. Even though City Hall is essentially paved, it is a public open space, and with the, the, you know, uh, the parkway going essentially to its heart, it carries the park all the way there and makes it part of Penn's 
grid system and Penn Squares, which, as I said, moved around. The things you think of Rittenhouse Square and, and the others, they weren't always there, um, especially not in the beginning. It took them a long time to settle in the places that they finally settled. Um, there was a huge pressure when it was realized that people were selling all those beautiful villas on the Delaware, and basically a lot of sort of squatters and squatter industries and then larger industries and mills, and the railroad itself, which was a huge uh, intervention, uh, began to take the character of the banks of the river and, and the whole uh, you know, plateau and bluffs and river landscape. Uh, so, in creating the waterworks uh, to, for where drinking water, this was where the drinking water for Philadelphia downtown came. And then you see Lemon Hill, which is the uh, little um, house on the top there. This sort of one of the first acquired pieces of property. And you see now how it's going to flow down the Delaware. You also see some paddle boats, which we're going to talk about later. Do you see them on the side there? They're waiting to pick up passengers and go up the Delaware to the mouth of the Wissahickon. And since we're going to use the Wissahickon as one of the examples of this interfingering system, one that follows the pattern of circulation of water, which is the blood of the landscape, um, I want to also just remind you what happens when the parks don't work. And poor old Cobbs Creek, which has a lot of potential, but very bad relationships to the neighborhood, very poor interfaces, a lot of short dumping because people have very little access. And they can't get into the park, and when they get in, look at the trails. I mean, they're terrifyingly complex. They're completely rogue trails. And uh, there's a lot of abandoned trails. It's just not a well-used place. And that is a design fault. It's been designed not to be a good park. Um, see the huge inn holding up at the top? That's just one of the many design decisions that have been made that will screw up a riverbank park, a uh, river valley park. And then you see that in some places it gets so tight that you're, you only have one side of the river, or you barely have even one side of the river, and then another piece of Cobbs Creek Park picks up after a good deal of urban fabric in the middle, and then goes on and is a very skinny sort of leg that continues on from this. Uh, but there you see the problems uh, with a landscape that is fundamentally like the Wissahickon. Um, and could have been just as fabulous. Um, one of the things about the Wissahickon is that uh, most of it's not in the city. And there you see two-thirds of the watershed are in uh, Montgomery County and beyond. Um, there you see the part that's in the city, right in the northwest corner. And that's uh, one of the things, I'm just going to take it and say, what are the things that makes this thing work? And how can we repeat it throughout the city in various ways? Uh, what are the core principles? One of them is this largely unbroken corridor. Every time you break up a park, and this is of course the problem with the parks that are in the grid, and we're still thinking about these little square pieces of green in the grid, um, the problem with that is you don't get continuity. And one of the reasons two million people use this park is because they can bicycle all the way from above Valley Green right down through Ridge Avenue, which is a messy entrance, but then into East and West Parks and down to City Hall. So um, this unbroken corridor within the city with all of its faults and all of its loss of really great transitions and great entries into different landscapes uh, is still the only park, except for Pennypack, that's continuous in the city. And it's also continuous outside the city, which Pennypack is not because the uh, Pennsylvania Turnpike crosses the, the top of the city right 
at where Pennypack comes out of the city. And then it picks up again with the Pennypack Ecological Trust, who've done just wonderful things to preserve huge amounts uh, of the river corridor outside the city. But there's a great gap, and there's no real interchange. There's no porosity. Here, uh, you can see two things. Uh, one is this wonderful interfingered system there in, uh, you know, from East Falls all the way up to the top of Chestnut Hill. And then the river, the Wishaken, is not preserved by parkland. The parkland is the dark green and the green, and um, the uh, yellow and light green are large, private, semi-public properties like colleges, universities, arboretums, schools, um, you name it. Uh, from Carson Valley to Erdenheim Farms, that's a private place, which uh, is, you can see here, and it's incredibly romantic. As you leave the city, you leave the gorge, you leave these uh, crystalline rocks of the Piedmont, and you go into the great limestone valley, passing this wonderful gateway of chicky quartzite ridges, and you just press through there between the Arboretum and um, Chestnut Hill College, and you're out into this extraordinary rich farmland with, you know, low rolling hills. Um, so, unfortunately, much of the drive, and there was a huge drive, to extend the parkland here beyond uh, the city boundaries never came about because um, the proposal went to the state, and they said, yes, great, we'll, propose, we'll preserve Washington's legacy, and he camped at Fort Washington, so let's take the hilltops. <laughs> so they took the hilltops and basically left the stream, um, you know, to, in many cases, private property comes right up to the banks, with lawns generally tilting right down, and driveways, and terraces, and roofs all pouring uh, their water uh, off those impervious surfaces. But that gives you a sense of the pastoral landscape. It's very much crafted, uh, and it's, that landscape is copied from a picture by Constable which was hanging over the Wideners who owned this property before, it was hanging over their fireplace. So every morning, they would look at it and say, let's shape the landscape to look like this ideal English landscape. And it does, and this part of the world uh, in Montgomery County really works well to do that. And one of the things you get with this continuous corridor is you get the city landscape, the parkway, you get east and west parks, which are sort of the, the, the high bluffs and the plateaus, uh, the rolling plateaus, which are somewhat open, and this sort of broad river. And then you get the Wishicken Valley, which is a steep, dramatic gorge. And you come out of this steep, dramatic gorge, and you have yet another landscape, which is the rolling pastoral, English pastoral landscape uh, of the Middle Valley. And that goes all the way up to Fort Washington, where the uh, turnpike then comes across as a great barrier at uh, Hope um, Lodge. This is the picture. This is taken by Paul Meyer, by the way, the director of the Morris Arboretum. But what's wonderful about it is this is Erdenheim Farms, and that's Chestnut Hill College, sort of in the middle there, the uh, French village on the hill or the Italian hill town. And then you're going up and you're seeing that you have a solid corridor of green along the river right to the city at the back there. Um, the other thing, I think, that was greatly in favor of the success of the Wissahickon was that people came there naturally long before it was a park. And the reason they came there was because it was so dramatic. So this gorge with its rocks, it brought artists, and Thomas Moran did lots of paintings of it. His brother did lots of photographs. Edgar Allan Poe wrote about it. Um, Fanny Kemble wrote that disgustingly sentimental poem about it, which isn't even accurate. And um, on and on. But Fanny Kemble won the Civil War, and let us never forget it. Remember, she was married to Pierce Butler, whom some of you are related to, and who was the largest slave owner in the United States and lived in Philadelphia. 
And she was so disgusted by what went on on those plantations that she went back, she divorced him, she went back home and lobbied all the English lords in Parliament and all the uh, people in the Co House of Commons to absolutely not let England join the war. And so France helped us and England did not intervene very much. And basically we were allowed to, the North was allowed to win the war. Uh, but here it is, you know, it has a fabulous natural fabric. Thank you for doing that, by the way. I do, I think it was Yeats who said, I had a devil of a lot of problem getting this into poetry, so I'm going to read it as if it's poetry. Well, you know, one's fiddling around on one's Mac and having a devil of a lot of trouble, and it's all jumping around, and one wants the pictures to really look great, so thank you for turning the lights uh, and here, in present day, it's still wonderful for all the use and abuse that it has gone through as a beloved public park um, with present stewardship by the Fairmount Park Commission and now the City Department of Re uh, Parks and Recreation. Um, it, it has a very strong civic uh, support from the very beginning, from banning cars in the, uh, you know, there were two million cars by 1905 in the, uh, in the Fairmount Park system altogether. And uh, citizens of the Northwest got together and really created the banning uh, of the cars. And that horrible Wissahickon parade, which everybody thinks is about horses, is not about that at all. It's about celebrating the victory over getting cars on a pathway, which was once the Wissahickon Turnpike, and now has been named Forbidden Drive. Um, the other thing that I think is a great principle of success, and you notice that Cobbs Creek did not have it at all, but none of the others do either, not even Pennypack, which is relatively intact. A broad pathway, which we were very lucky historically, there was a there was a turnpike, that's the Wissahickon Turnpike, coming up there and carriages could go on it and ultimately automobiles uh, ran on it. But it made a broad, relatively gentle pathway that really has encouraged all kinds of people. And it was very hard to pick these slides because I have about a hundred of people doing all kinds of very different things. Uh, and you'll see too at Valley Green. It's uh, just an extraordinary thing because you get the adventure trails, which are somewhat difficult to walk on, and then you have this broad sort of promenade, this thoroughfare that runs along the river all the way to the end of the park, although not all of it is the Wissahickon Turnpike, so not all of it is as nice as that part that runs up the north piece of the Wissahickon. Uh, Valley Green, having a central destination, that's another thing that none of the other parks really have, even when they have environmental centers. And we have an environmental center in the Wissahickon, and it's certainly not a central destination. This is the heart of the park. And out of the once dark hemlocks, which have now all died of varying uh, pests and diseases, um, and you can see a little bit of them there in that very early historical picture, uh, this has become the great common ground, the great melding place, the circle of light the flat place where children can come and feed the ducks, where families can have picnics, where weddings can take place along the banks of, of the Wizhick and where you can go skating when it freezes, and where you can eat both hot dogs and steak. And I think that's one of the terribly important things in making a great public space. It, it uses a layered history. There's a whole series of different owners with different ideas about what should be in it and how it should be run. And the second thing is it's got all these layers like a palimpsest still left for us to taste and to make richness. Now, the great tragedy, of course, was that here are, this is an incredible mill in the upper uh, Lin Livesey Mill, and they tore these two things down and saved a most ghastly Miller's house, which now becomes part of Philadelphia's extensive collection of small historical houses that no one knows what to do with. But we could have used those great public spaces. That would have been fabulous. That's probably putting people too much in the dark. 
this is probably, uh, if I don't do it with this speech, <laughs> this is probably the most important thing I have to say today. That if we could start to take these lessons in building our community, we would truly have not only a gradient of wildness, but nature even at the heart of the densest and most paved parts of our urban fabric. And there you see Chestnut Hill, admittedly poor thing. Uh, Roxborough was developed after the war, and you all know that you know Philadelphia was desperate for a tax base. Uh, everyone was leaving on the Schuylkill Expressway, which had just been built, and going to the suburbs where there was just acres of farmland. And uh, so they looked to Roxborough, the northeast, and to the north, I mean, Roxborough, the northwest, uh, which was all farmland at that time, and also, sadly, North Philadelphia, northeast Philadelphia, and you got the same kind of 1950s automobile-oriented ranch house grass plot matrix, and they make a wall, as you can see, against the, in other words, there's a grass plot, and then there is the natural world. Just as if you would put up a chain link fence between a national park and all the sort of motels that serve it. And here, exactly the opposite happened, because Chestnut Hill was developed from the ridge, which was the old Indian pa pathway, down. The ridge is colonial. The next piece is Victorian. The third piece is 1920s country houses. And so the rich with big lots, and this is counterintuitive. God knows I never would have understood it before. Um, but you don't, you know, the poor generally get crammed up together, unless it's a really special spot, and then the rich get crammed up together. But here, there is enough room, and you can see the forest just flowing on up through it gets thinner and thinner and less and less expressed, but you have a gradient of wildness and you have real urban wildlands penetrating everyone. And because these houses and lots are so big and because drainage channels were generally preserved, there are rights of way between them that anybody can walk up and through. Um, whereas you can, you know, all of this is private property. There's no, you know, there's a clear distinction between private and public. Uh, but these are just maps that begin to show that, and one of the things the open space type shows is that the Wissahickon is extended by all those institutions. Unfortunately, this is black and white, and I am going to color these pictures at some point, but uh, one of the things you see is the cross-hatched versus the hatched are the big institutional properties that are directly next to the Wissahickon. They started as great big estates, they ended up as institutions as the rich moved out and no one could maintain them. Uh, so that you actually extend, these are the guardians of the open space that is the next tier. Because uh, they're large buildings on very, very large pieces of land which slopes the most steeply down into the valley. And here you uh, just see uh, this density gradient. The thing that I talked about, the ridge is colonial, the next is Victorian. So that's the big house plopped in the middle of a half acre, quarter acre lot. And then you get the country houses, which are one room deep, L-shaped or T-shaped, built out of Wishick and Schist and reaching into the landscape with large lots, which are left wild at the edges. So that, you know, if you want to put petunias, put them up at your terrace. Just like the English landscapes of uh, Capability Brown, you start with a formal garden next to the house, but very shortly you move into a pastoral landscape and then into a wild woods, with manicured wild woods, but nevertheless. Um, I really need to point this out. And so um, do you see that that end is Roxburgh? And you see that even though Roxburgh has more parkland than the Wissahickon on this side, Roxburgh's on that side, you can see those new post-war developments making those little horseshoes and an absolutely firm line between development and the public open space. And here in Chestnut Hill, you see the fingering, the gradual reduction of density, um, the fingering from Germantown Avenue, which is the Ridge Road there uh, in, the, in the up 
middle sort of. And then as you go down, you see gradually the uh, houses petering out, the fingers of, that's Cresham Creek fingering up, um, many other creeks, that's the, uh, uh, and many institutions are keeping this space as a transition area between the dense urban fabric and the public wild lands that are the public open space in the community. Um, and this is the map that really shows it. Uh, I call it the finger map. And <laughs> if we preserve the real pattern, and we didn't start out doing that in the Wissick, and we just preserved 300 feet on either side, um, it was the Houstons, the wealthy families, the Woodwards, uh, who were developing the community with the railroad, who began, who owned most of these tributary, the lands along these tributaries, and began to give them to Fairmount Park because they loved the Wissick and, and they, they really wanted to preserve these fingers coming up. And that's what's allowed each house and I live on one of these little fingers so that I'm in the woods, even though I'm not in the woods. I'm in a residential neighborhood that might be like any suburbs. At the same time, I just have to walk down Valley Green Road and I'm right there. And it's all woodland all the way down. Um, this, by the way, was one of the wonderful ways people could participate in these fingers. This is Henry School, which is a public school. And those are the students in the 1940s in Carpenter Woods when it was still intact, in the open part which was kept open and mowed as a meadow with a little stream running through it, they're doing a bird mask. They're all dressed as hunters and birds. And Carpenter's Woods was preserved as a bird sanctuary. So every year the students come out there and do a bird mask. <laughs> mask. Um, the other extraordinary thing really are the roads and the uh, train tracks rather than cutting the community off and forming a wall and having one part of the community be on the wrong side of the tracks. The tracks are either sunken or elevated, and uh, I didn't show the elevated one, but uh, you remember that great trestle bridge that used to go over um, uh, Cresham Valley. But there you see it, so that always the landscape fabric flows through the community, it's never interrupted. Um, because either the, the railway is above or the railway is sunk down, so it also it's closes in and becomes part of the neighborhood. So the train stations become part of the neighborhood landscape. Um, at the community level, too, there are historical precedents, some of which that's a um, Richard Snowden rebuilt gutter, and that's one that we did for a large property at the edge of the Wissahickon. But there are these wonderful traditions of managing water out in the open and leaving as many drainage channels, even tiny ones, as possible. And here is Richard Snowden's ex-property. And uh, I don't think he did this, but it's just a wonderful thing in which uh, this little streamlet, very tiny, has become their terrace. Of course it can flood. It is channelized, but it's crazy channelized. I mean, it's all zigzaggy. It's not one straight channel that shoots the water down. It follows the natural contours of the stream, does stabilize it, which isn't very ecological, but um, it does provide a wonderful interface between the house, its formal spaces, its lawns, and its open space, which really participate in the natural world. And this is the French village which was developed by the Woodwards uh, with some very, very famous, well-known Philadelphia architects like uh, McGoodwin and Meller, Meggs and Howe. And uh, it is a very interesting mix of housing types and um, uh, sizes of lots. It goes everywhere from a quarter acre or an eighth of an acre uh, on Gate Lane to uh, uh, massive properties uh, on Elbow Lane, but what is important is look at where it is. That is Fairmount Park at Cresham Creek. So the whole community can participate in a whole system that takes you down to the Wissahickon through a natural area and also preserves uh, the drainage of that area. And uh, up there, that's Gate Lane at the back and this is Elbow Lane at the front. And that's Gate Lane right there. Um, with, it's just a series of row houses, really. Public parking, 
um, joint, four or five cars and a little space carved into the hill. And then here's another typical way that uh, parking is dealt with in Chestnut Hill and Mount Airy, are these wonderful little alleys behind the houses. And again, just sort of dotted public spaces that you could come and park in. And this is a sense of, uh, this was one of the old mansions, and the old, the old mansions are absolutely vital as well as the institutions. The old mansions that didn't get made into institutions and were going to be torn down and a uh, hundred houses put up uh, have also been recycled in very creative ways in the community. So you have the mansion itself, the formal garden, this one done by Olmsted, and it's very beautiful. And then the sort of lawns which go down, they sweep down to the meadows of Cresham Creek and then into the forested corridor that takes you to the Wissahickon and to Devil's Pool. Um, and again, just little ways, much more imaginative ways to treat a street. If I ever see street trees planted, you know, boom, 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 at 30 feet on center, um, I'll go mad. Um, it's almost like a hedgerow. Here they happen to be European lindens, but doesn't matter. Uh, it could be a hedgerow of locusts. It could be a hedgerow of ash and red maple. We can do a lot more things with streets and make them really into cathedrals, naves, and side aisles, making the streets into real spaces that are part of the garden, part of the forested community, and part of a whole network of intermingling open space. Um, these, this is a, a front and this is a garden. This is an eighth of an acre lot. It's a duplex in Chestnut Hill, right up very close to, to um, Germantown Avenue, the commercial street. And you see it's a forested garden. What has it got in it? It's got hemlock, uh, rhododendron, not that rhododendron's native, but <laughs> it's native further south. And it will be native with global warming. But basically the whole idea is that it's a shaded, layered, forested space, even though it's just, it's less than 20 feet wide. And then there's the front of Ernesta Ballard's house, which is right next to High Hollow, for those of you who know it, Miller, Meigs, and Howe. Uh, this is only a half acre. Uh, it's pushed very far to the front, but what is interesting about it is really how the forest wraps around and becomes part of the front landscape, up to and including the idea of using moss as the lawn. And then this sense, and this is a huge house right at the edge of the woods, uh, but this sense that the house is absolutely encircled and part of this wonderful wooded community. And it's not inhumane and it's not wild and scary, but it is, it keeps the feeling of the place. And of course, by using uh, the native stone, um, Again, they've kept bringing in and slate, uh, bluestone actually, and they've used both the materials and the configuration of the houses as well as their placement and not tearing down the trees. One of the things you see is when the people from California move to Philadelphia, the first thing they do is tear down our trees. They have clearly not experienced a Philadelphia summer. Um, there's supposed to be a companion picture, but ignore this. This just shows you that these houses reflect the outside inside. There's one room deep. This is the entrance foyer. You look out to the woods on that side and out to the garden on the other. So the landscape is always part of the experience. And it can be with one room deep houses. The front of the house is always part of it. You look through the house and through the room um, and out into the garden, which is an a half room, an outdoor room, and this is a half room, half garden, half building. And it's one of, again, those wonderful meeting places between architecture and landscape architecture in which both benefit each other. And I just love this. This is, again, this is a half acre lot. That's the Wissahickon Woods. Uh, that is an extension from the house. They didn't build it as a solid wall. They let one tree hop over, and they have these series of arches which become framed views of a drainage channel which goes down to the Wissahickon. Um, this was just some of the imaginative recycling of the old estates. This was done by uh, Jim Kyes at Kyes Straw and Clodner. Uh, and he's built new houses, but he's built them, as you can see, around and as part of the old formal gardens of the estate and managed them to preserve uh, four 
all the people who live there, the sort of transitions, the lawns, the meadows, the woodlands, the forest that go down in a gradient of wildness to our public wildlands. Um, oh, unfortunate Roxborough. Uh, was farmland, as you can see. Uh, this is um, Andorra Shopping Center. That's Henry Avenue cutting through there. A huge arterial that was extended uh, basically from Germantown all the way up to the top of Chestnut Hill. And then they took poor old Cathedral Road and <laughs> made it five lanes wide because they were going to have a bridge that crossed from Roxborough to Chestnut Hill, which was squelched. Uh, but what has happened is the paradigm of the period, the automobile suburb, has now become the signature of Roxborough. Upper Roxburgh. Anyway, there you have it. That was in 1976, by the way. Trees have grown a bit more. But it's still basically a desolate barrier. And then in Roxburgh, you see how the park right there is just cut. No fingers come through, and the houses are a solid wall against nature seeping up into the public spaces of the core of the community. And uh, there are huge consequences to this. Um, one is that as we build our houses with roofs and lawns and steep driveways on this very steep wooded terrain and rocky, um, we, what starts there ends up here. And this is our public park. This is the piece of land we thought we had preserved, and it's being ripped to pieces. Uh, there, of course, is the absorption rate. And you all know that if you don't infiltrate the water that falls on your ground uh, and displace it, put it in a pipe and dump it in the stream, there is no water in the groundwater to fill the stream when it's not raining. So you get what you see in most of these suburban tributaries, which look, they look like roads going up into the suburbs, and they're actually stream valleys. And then when we have a severe storm, they become raging torrents. Um, many people actually have, are now growing up without knowing what a healthy forest looks like. Um, I think all of you could recognize a disturbed forest, but uh, few of us know that worms are not native here. These are Asian worms. They're brought in by fishermen and gardeners because we've all been told how good worms are. Uh, and how good for the soil. They're not good for the soil. They change the pH, they change the chemistry, they chew up the leaf litter, they do everything wrong. We are a fungal-based system in the forest, and there you see the webs of uh, mycorrhiza and fungi, uh, which a healthy forest supports. And here you see the thin, bare soil covered in worms that come out after it rains, and Japanese honeysuckle, etc., in the pitiful remnants of trees. Um, troubled tributaries, almost all of the tributaries of the Wissahickon could have been better architected, better planned, better whatever, and we need to seize this. That's the parking lot of a hotel, and there's really no reason why it should extend to the edge of the pitiful bank of Sandy Run. And there you see it. It's Fort Washington. I know it was developed in a very bad period. Uh, again, the Fort Washington Office Park, which now is being abandoned because it floods all the time. But this sort of treatment is just bad design. You don't need to do it this way. Um, and you can see uh, the Wissahickon and its uh, Sandy Run tributary, which is a huge tributary that goes off beyond the boundaries of the city. And this is Cresham Creek. This is within the boundaries of the city. Uh, this is the abandoned railroad track that is directly adjacent to the creek, a clear possibility for a trail, and this is the headwaters. The headwaters is entirely in lawn, and you can see the stream channel itself is in lawn, and it's next to the USDA, which is 100% in lawn that isn't building and asphalt. So again, we have so many choices, we just don't take them. And it's all, of course, very steep and running right off into the Cresham Creek, ending in it looking like this. Um, Chesson Hill College, I just want to show you a few projects and can't do these justice, but there is the old Chesson Hill College, and the light green is the old DeWey's Mill Pond that was on this very meandering creek. Uh, the college in the 60s, as many, many institutions did, found the desperate need 
to fill in the floodplain and put parking and they would have put buildings if the law had let them. But uh, in fact, they put parking and the students get swept away practically yearly. And um, also there are ball fields which have to be redone uh, every year. Uh, but there you see the, that filling of the creek in an institution. And now one of the wonderful things is they're coming back and um, uh, this is the scheme, and you see it's Sailor Greg, and um, that is the existing student life public space, which is simply a roundabout for cars. There is a huge 20-foot wall between the college on the ridge and the floodplain with the Wissahickon and the parking lots, et cetera. And so Peter, who is here, Peter Saylor, has proposed that the student life building be a set of stairs which take you down and break up that barrier between the floodplain and the buildings on the ridge. And again, we can start using buildings really to solve many of our access, landscape problems, et cetera, et cetera. These are places where we could come together very fruitfully. And there's the view back to that student center and the Wissahickon winding around. It's a great new bridge, by the way, designed by H2L2. Um, porous paving. The institutions, this was the Morris Arboretum in 1982, who took the responsibility for the Wissahickon Creek. It was the first time a horticultural institution got off its patootie and said, yes, we need to be good neighbors, and the environment is part of being a good neighbor. It's not just about orchids and uh, lilies in very fancy formal gardens. Uh, so they began with this, and you can see the porous paving. It goes to that great basin underneath, and then um, the road itself is conventional. The bays are porous, and you can see the water being soaked up as it goes down. And also, the whole parking lot is curved along the contours. That's another area in which we use the grid where we don't need to use the grid. We're always making these desperate rectangular parking lots on a curved contour. We can do so many beautiful things, setting things in, as Frank Lloyd Wright said, into the brow of the hill, which is exactly what this parking lot has done. Um, and we can work together to make the whole thing far less wasteful and far more beautiful. And it's dead flat. Nothing more annoying than parking on a 45 degree angle. <laughs> you know, you're getting out on one side and all your stuff is falling down. You know, with this, it has to be flat because it has to absorb the stormwater. So it gives you a great excuse to make courtyards out of your parking lots instead of ghastly, slanted, uh, you know, carpets of asphalt. And this is the other great contribution that the Morris Arboretum made. They took the uh, drained farmlands of John Morris. He was an experimental farmer working in the 1890s when you did that kind of thing. And they returned it to marshland. And it's not only given them a huge new constituency in the bird people, but it's also given them a new curated natural habitat. So we look at all these plants and say, what are they and how do they grow, et cetera. And there you see the patterns uh, in the landscape as, it, as this, which was soggy um, farmland, becomes part of the exhibits. And again, at the edge of the property, where the property begins to meet the Wissahickon. So it's a gradient of wildness with the formal buildings, the formal gardens, et cetera, up near the houses, and then as you get down. This is El Chipo's solution to porous paving. This was our Lincoln Mercury Mafia dealer in Chestnut Hill in 1980. And um, basically, all this is running off into Cresham Creek and absolutely destroying it. You saw what it looked like. Uh, this was the cheapest, quickest, dirtiest solution that we could have used. We scraped up the asphalt, just leaving the parking. Uh, we dug trenches at the edge filled them in with the ground up asphalt, topped them with nice stone, and we could take the asphalt off the banks because now it's infiltrating, and it, the whole thing cost about $10,000, maybe a little less. Um, it was, you know, there are solutions for communities that are not 
very expensive. I'm certainly delighted with very expensive solutions mostly, uh, but you know, we can also go the other way. How can we make cheap and generally ugly materials look classy? Now, I'm not saying this looks classy because it doesn't, but take plywood and make a marble floor out of it. That sounds like it's not being true to form follows function, but it's amazing how beautiful it is. Um, now, this is part of the problem, that once you get the grid, you start thinking about open spaces, and this is only for metrics. The city is not doing this to say these green pieces are open. Uh, they're just saying if you could make them permeable, they would soak up X amount of stormwater, which wouldn't go into the combined sewer, et cetera. But what happens is you start thinking of an acre as a square, of, as squares of squares, always, you know, tightly bound within the uh, grid. And the real problem with this, and it's the problem the Recreation Department and Parks Department is facing now, is how do you begin to reach out into the neighborhoods? These things are bounded usually by major arterials, and they don't reach out and become part of a neighborhood. So you really have to begin to think, like Rittenhouse Square, of colonizing the street and making that part of the square, you know, of not necessarily making squares, et cetera, and how do you join them? Um, this is a project uh, that was done with a series of uh, Philadelphia agencies um, by my partner, uh, Jose Almignano, who's going to take people to um, one of our projects. But um, this is partnered with the Pennsylvania Horticulture Society, the Water Department, who has been a great leader, uh, Parks and Rec, uh, and a number of others, but chiefly spearheaded by those two. And it is the transformation of Midvale Avenue into a complete street which, it's, as uh, those of you who know it, and you'll see the picture in a minute, it's a straight shot right down to the Schuylkill. Uh, there it is, straight shot right down to the Schuylkill, and you can see the very, very steep topography and um, how it ends in the Schuylkill. Um, this was the charrette with the city coming up with things, and uh, this was the great revel revelation of this whole business when they looked at what land was available. Where is the land in the city? Where can you begin to make open space that you don't have to, uh, you know, take private land? And when you look at it and you begin to map it, the rights of way are everywhere. Utility corridors, rail uh, railroad corridors, road rights of way. There are huge amounts of open space, which we don't even read as open space now because they're mostly, uh, you know, sort of leftover areas. Uh, and this is, of course, what Midvale Avenue looks like in the middle. That's the plan for it. And this is what it would look like with a series of basically waterfalls and water treatment gardens, uh, which take you down, making the street uh, one way at certain times. Uh, and multimodal, uh, lots of bus stops and train stations and things like that, all of which are already there, and re really configuring it, reconfiguring it. But it does require the owners on the side to buy into this and to become part of it. So part of the design is acting as a mediator and really beginning to point out, if we have stormwater taxes, uh, how this is going to reduce, for instance, their economic burdens. Um, this is a complete street done in Washington by Trini Rod Rodriguez, of Parker Rodriguez. And one, I'm just showing it very quickly to show you, it doesn't have to be like Portland. They pioneered it, but it doesn't have to be a straight channel running down the street. This is a great curving, looping thing with benches in it. The street is 25 feet wide. Uh, there's commercial on one side. This thing shrinks and makes plazas where the doors to the commercial are, and then gets wider where, you know, you have those banks of windows, et cetera. So it's really taking advantage of the urban configuration as well and making something that is much more vegetation friendly and people friendly. Um, this is a project um, that Jose did too. It's uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson University, and I'm just gonna show it to you very quickly. What it is basically about is if you build a project, do not let it contribute to most cities, or most eastern cities, already overburdened uh, storm sewer, 
sewer system, which are combined so that in heavy storms, which we're getting more and more frequently, uh, we're into the problem of uh, just every new building dumps on a, an already strained infrastructure, is dumping more stormwater from its impervious material. So this becomes, like Rittenhouse Square, a nexus, a, a shortcut. It becomes green in the city, and it's over a parking garage. And this is what it looked like beforehand. 93% impervious. Uh, and there you see it on the top. You remember that hideous garage that was there by the hospital. Um, this is the new scheme, um, which is also for graduation, which is why it has this central seating area. And this is the parking garage underneath. And this is the water system, all the air conditioning, condensate, all of um, the runoff is stored in these cisterns and then reused for those long, droughty Philadelphia summers. And between that and the planting mixes on the top uh, and the tree trenches, a huge amount of water is taken out of the public system. Uh, it's not a burden on the public system anymore. And, and the public system is under mandate to fix itself. And here are those special soil mixes, what they look like, the roof and what it looks like. Um, then the final uh, project, which as you can see, just like Rittenhouse, the success of Rittenhouse Square, is this wonderful nexus of paths. You know, you come together and you take the diagonal, and it's the shortcut. And then when you come to the center, you're both actor and participant. I mean, you're, you're participant and also watcher. So the whole center becomes a stage. Uh, as people flow in different directions using this park as the quickest way to get somewhere. And there it is at night. Uh, very quickly, uh, these little patches, again, the urban land, the patches that have been abandoned, that are vacant. This was several parking lots and, and sort of pathetic <coughs> recreational facilities which had sort of moldered away um, the plan. But the most important thing is that basin there, which has been designed by the Water Department. Andrew Pogon did the design for the buildings and the restoration of the bank and all the facilities. But the Water Department has put under those previous parking lots a huge storage basin to take the runoff from very highly built up Maniunk and store it there before it dumps into the Schuylkill and makes more burden downstream. Um, and then lastly, this is just these wonderful potentials and opportunities. That's the historic gateway from East Park, which is the bluffs and the uh, pastoral sort of plateaus, to the very steep gorge of the Wissaken, and with the railroad bridge acting um, as the uh, entrance. And here we see what's happened, and now the entrance goes through uh, one of the arches, and it still does, even though they've repaired the ramps and everything. And you've taken all the space, which is this very important event, the confluence of the Wissahickon and the Schuylkill. Uh, and there was the old entrance. And what I wanted to do is put a slide of the new one going through the ramps, which have, you know, halfway up there. Uh, and our, um, a very strange experience. Ridge Avenue. Every day, my heart is wrung by the bicyclists trying to get across here. And again, it's just an opportunity that is waiting to make one of these thresholds, to make an event, to make an introduction to Maniunk, to make the uh, entrance to the Wissahickon, to make the entrance to East and West Parks. And um, this was one of the historical things, and you've all seen those sort of forlorn boathouses on East River Drive. Uh, they are the remnants from the East Falls boating houses and boat landing. And so there was a boat landing at the, um, the confluence of the Wissahickon, where the canoe club now is. Um, and there is the canoe club having its 14th annual regatta in June 1912, and they still, now kayaking is the new thing, and they go kayaking, but there's a lot of boat traffic. The boat basin uh, at Boathouse Row is before the falls. It could be a continuous trip down there. Um, and here we see people getting off from the below the falls, the lower Schuylkill, uh, at Bartram's Gardens and the sort of water trolley that's taking them uh, to the garden. So 
there's this huge opportunity to open up again, more space we don't even think about, and I'm almost finished. And here is just a close-up of that. And I just wanted to absolutely close with this. That's Ian McCarg's book, Design with Nature, uh, written in 1976, I think, and that shows you each overlay is a light gray. So when it becomes black, it means all the features are building up to say no, unsuitable for urban development. And these are the flood, this is Staten Island, and that's the flood evacuation zones that were set by New York City and published in the New York Times very recently. Um, this is a wonderful scheme. MoMA, by the way, has a fabulous exhibit on various ways to begin to mitigate the storm surge. Uh, I didn't put it in, but uh, when you see the two rivers coming down, uh, runoff from the two rivers coming down, tidal surges coming in on the high tide, uh, and the winds blowing it in, and the tip of lower Manhattan needs buffering. Uh, here it would be a series of marshes, and you can see the geotextile tubes and how that would be planted and carried out. And he also had very interesting ideas for the street. This is another one for Brooklyn uh, adjacent, and this is to create, you know, that in those channels there were very famous oyster beds. This is to recreate these riverine tidal oyster beds, use them to unpollute the water, to treat the water, and also as a series of stepping stones where Ultimately, you can harvest the oysters and also use it as recreation, etc. And just to say, as a last thing, something I think we're all coming together on is the most exciting thing and it's changing the whole urban fabric is this business of fusing the realms of experience and the realms of experts and expertise. Uh, coming together to make that sweet spot in the center. And thank you very much, and I'm sorry I ran on a bit long. <laughs>